there be peace or war? The fateful question posed by Warren Austin, head of the United States delegation to the UN, set the mood of the world at the century's halfway mark. The seating of nationalist China's delegate on the Security Council precipitated a clash between the free nations and the Soviet bloc. In the absence of Soviet obstruction, the Security Council voted overwhelmingly in favor of armed intervention to protect the Korean Republic. But there was worse to come. A highly trained and well-equipped North Korean army swarmed across the 38th parallel to attack unprepared South Korean defenders. Caught off guard, they were all but overwhelmed until the United Nations took its historic vote to intervene. While the Korean Republicans fought a desperate delaying action, a United Nations police force with General Douglas MacArthur as commander-in-chief was formed. During the early days of U.N. action, General MacArthur fought a grim defensive battle. His troops outnumbered three and four to one. Stubbornly, forces under his command clung to a shrinking beachhead in southeast Korea. And for months, the Allies fought to keep from being driven into the sea. This, a savage war of attrition, in which no quarter was given by a foe equipped with the latest Russian armament. It was, in fact, a war of survival to gain time. The cost was high to Americans who bore the brunt under the U.N. banner. For here they faced an enemy who ruthlessly slaughtered prisoners, many with their arms bound. Scores died before red guns as they stood helpless. Yes, the cost to free men came hideously high as they bought time on the rapidly narrowing perimeter of their defense. In the first months of conflict, casualties mounted with terrifying speed. But 12 nations had rallied to the United Nations banner. With help of this kind, plus air contingents and ground forces from other nations, the tide seemed to have turned when a brilliant strategic move was made in the amphibious landing at Incheon, port city of Seoul. Between 35 and 40,000 men were landed behind the enemy's lines in an operation executed without a hitch. Seemingly, the war had reached a turning point as the fresh troops started an encircling move of the North Koreans. Well armed and equipped, they moved steadily forward toward the Manchurian border under an air cover that hammered incessantly at North Korean supply lines and industrial centers. The end of the war seemed in sight as the Allies pushed north toward the North Korean capital of Pyongyang and further northward to the Manchurian and Siberian borders. General Lawton Collins arrives in Washington. After conferring with General MacArthur, he gives an optimistic note to the Korean picture. Based on what I've seen, the conferences I've had with General MacArthur and his principal field commanders, I'm sure that while the situation there is serious, that our forces will be able to take care of themselves without further serious losses. Then it happened. The Chinese Red Armies, numbering hundreds of thousands, swarmed over the frontier against thinly held United Nations positions. Confronted by overwhelming numbers, UN armies were forced into inevitable retreat, while men wondered whether Red China would touch off World War III. Again fighting a delaying action, UN troops paid heavily in casualties. During a nightmare of ambush and frozen weeks, they took countless prisoners and a fantastic toll of enemy killed and wounded. The Chinese Reds also suffered the rigors of the North Korean winter. A frozen hand can't grasp a cup, and he learns the meaning of humanity from a Marine. The frightful hardships of the United Nations troops as they fought their way every step is illustrated by this Chinese prisoner whose feet are encased in a solid sheath of ice. At Hong Nam, an Armada stands by to evacuate the beleaguered 20,000 UN troops. But as they face an estimated force of 160,000 Chinese, they defend their rapidly shrinking perimeter with its store of supplies. Oil and fuel supplies, with the exception of the vast quantities taken aboard ship, are systematically destroyed. In the course of the carefully planned withdrawal, more than 400 freight cars and 30 locomotives were wrecked. chimney is in the path of artillery fire, but not for long. A cave of alcohol is blasted. The entire city is put to the torch in one of the most scientific jobs of demolition in military history. 
protected by a ring of steel from land and naval batteries, the port city is reduced to a shambles in the two weeks that preceded the loading of the Armada of 160 evacuation vessels. With the demolition completed, the last of the rear guard troops are withdrawn to be taken to Pusan on the southeast coast, where they will fight another day. Hungnam is a ghost city. Would the atom bomb be the answer to the Chinese hordes? President Truman said that it was under consideration. On his word alone rested the decision to unleash this awful force. The world shuddered at the thought. For this catastrophic weapon struck fear in the minds of men all over the world. It mushroomed into the symbol of modern destruction. This man had devised. And in the year 1950, its power edged ever closer to him, leaving death in horrible form in its wake. Its harvest of misery would be limitless, sparing no one. It might well mean a world of men ever fleeing its fury, a world in which no one might again find peace and security. And while man hoped for salvation, he could also work for it. Through the framework of his world parliament, the United Nations, symbol of man's hope for tomorrow. The 1950 Holy Year comes to an official close as Pope Pius XII officiates at the ceremonies of the closing of the Holy Door in St. Peter's Basilica. Three gilded bricks will be used to seal the door which will remain closed until the next Jubilee year, 25 years from now. The greatest Holy Year of the Church's 2,000-year history reaches its climax as His Holiness blesses the bricks. hundred thousand throng the square for the ceremony as the pontiff, last to pass through the door according to tradition, acts as mason in the first stages of the door's closing. This ends the most eventful year for His Holiness, a year which saw thousands of pilgrims thronging to Rome. Pope Pius, spiritual leader of hundreds of millions, will loom large in the history of the Catholic Church and as a humanitarian to men of all faiths. Main Street this week, Israeli soldiers marched in proud array. They were marking the start by the Hebrew calendar of the third year of their young nation's independence. May 15, 1948, in Tel Aviv, the independent state of Israel is proclaimed. At once, in every world capital, joy struck home to Jewish hearts. The first real occasion for it in centuries. This week, the citizens of Israel remembered those who had laid down their lives that a nation might live. This was a touching scene at Tel Aviv Military Cemetery. But in Jerusalem, there was rejoicing. To happy celebrants marching on the city, the third year looked even more promising. For Israel today had new and powerful friends. She sat in the UN, a proud member nation among nations. With their blood and hands, the Israeli people had forged a new way of life for themselves and generations to come. Victory ovations for Marshal Tito in Yugoslavia. The communist ruler has been touring his country, celebrating the election sweep of his followers, who took 95% of the popular vote. The result was no surprise. There were no other candidates. The Yugoslavs claim there is such broad agreement that it is practically impossible for any significant opposition to arise. Visiting newspaper men say that Tito has gained in popularity since his dispute with Moscow. That today many non-communists support him as the only man who can save Yugoslavia from Russian domination. Moscow now charges that Tito has loaded parliament with army officers and policemen instead of workers. Full production of Boeing's new Stratajet bomber is underway at Wichita, Kansas. Assembly of the world's fastest known bomber, the B-47, is being speeded by Rosie the Riveter and her co-workers in the huge plant. The Stratojet, an earlier model of which has flown faster than 600 miles per hour, can carry more than 10 tons of bombs. And here she goes, all six jet engines singing a song of speed and power. Stratogen is a welcome addition to freedom's arsenal. That all-American pastime, baseball, brings out the all-American girl baseball league for spring training at Alexandria, Virginia. Two 
two teams are working out the Fort Wayne Daisies and the Racine Bells, getting in shape for an opening day doubleheader. Okay, gals, play ball. Pat Scott has quite a curve, but this one is wide, and Gene Marlowe is willing to wait. Gene bunts it, the squeeze is on. Tibby Eisen slides home with a run and a nicely bruised leg. Better a bruise than long pants, eh, gals? Joe Weaver hits the long ball, almost out of the ballpark. Boy, that clears the base paths. And inside the park, Homer, by a whisker. The Los Angeles Rams with Bob Waterfield handling the passing chores. And with the former West Pointer Glenn Davis receiving, get off to a fast start against the Cleveland Browns in playoffs for the National League Championship. Touchdown for the Rams. 30,000 chill spectators see the Browns fight back. Otto Graham, the Cleveland Pro Team's ace aerialist, can't find a receiver, so he just proceeds to run with the ball. He's a threat no matter what he does. Here's Graham again, and he spots his man this time. Jones is the name, and hauling it in in the end zone is Jones to even the score at 7 all. cold, the ground's hard, and rough's the word for it, as former of the Rams slams through for a first down. On a handoff from Waterfield, Smith drives around the Browns flank to put the Rams within striking distance of the Cleveland goal line. Horner keeps going, and at the end of the third period, the Rams lead 28 to 20, a comfortable margin, or so it seems, until the Browns pick. Speedy is the combination that gets the fourth quarter rally going. It's an uphill battle for the Browns, but they're on their way. Graham to Baumgartner in the end zone. Now only one point separates the two teams. Still trailing, but with Otto Graham still clicking in the pass department, the Browns won't be denied. Jones carries to the 16 before the Rams stop him, and time is running out. With 20 seconds left to play, Lou Groza boots it through the uprights, and the Browns win 30 to 28. Groza's field goal turned an almost certain setback into glorious victory for the champions from Cleveland. They're off, was the cry that brought cheers to racing fans and brought new names to the winner's circle in the sport of kings. And one of the brightest names of 1950 was Hill Prince, Christopher Chennery's fleet three-year-old. First in the Preakness, second in the Derby, winner of the Wood Memorial and the Withers Mile, Hill Prince was named Horse of the Year. Two at Aintree, where England's big race of the year, the Grand National Steeplechase, had more than its usual quota of spine-tingling, bone-bruising spills. Many started, few finished this grueling test of man and mount. Victory was in the balance till the very last jump. Baseball and two big stories of the year. The Yankees wrote the first one. Again, they won the American League pennant. Casey Stengel's Bombers met Eddie Sawyer's Swiss Kids, the Phils in the World Series. It was age versus youth and age one in a four-game sweep that saw Joe DiMaggio, Phil Rizzuto, and company proving they were champs in convincing style. That made it series victory number 13. Lucky 13 for the New York Yankees. Winning was a habit with the champs. Baseball's second big story concerned Commissioner Happy Chandler and the surprise vote of the club owners at year's end not to renew his contract. Baseball said to Happy Chandler, you're out. Definitely in was a new film star. Here's Marilyn Monroe in her first screen test. I can't. And what did you come here for? To tell you you can't stay here. If those gorillas find you here, what happens to them? Nothing? They're just going to leave them alone? What's the matter with you, Benny? You can't take such a chance. You dumb broad. You stupid little... What's the matter? They followed you here. Or did you bring them with you? I ought to... Go ahead. It won't be the first time I've been worked over today. I'm getting used to it. Where are you going?
on the quiet Avenue Montaigne in Paris. A holdup. The gun-wielding desperado is none other than Humphrey Bogart, practicing for his next tough guy role in the movies. The victims are two of his French friends. The doorman gets in on the act, too, and so does Lauren Bacall, Bogie's wife. Baby looks at some expensive jewelry, but Hubby refuses to be held up and says a firm no. And speaking of couples, here are two of television's zaniest. Oh, George, look what Mamie brought from San Francisco. Uh, our old high school yearbook. Where are the children? Well, uh, Mamie's getting them ready for bed. Oh, well, good, good. We can relax for a little while. Yes. Oh, you see you, that? You're going to love this. This might be interesting. Uh. <gasps> oh. There. oh, look. Uh, that's uh, um, uh, Millie Brown. She was the smartest girl in the class. Gracie, there's something I always want to ask you. What? How far did you go in school? Well, if I liked the boy, I let him put his arm around me. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's what I meant. Oh, yes. there's Millie again. Yes. You, you know, I remember that dress she's wearing. It was a mother. <clears throat> it cost $7.07. Seven that's an odd figure. Yeah, she got that from her mother, too. <laughs> yes. Hey, Millie Brown was very popular, wasn't oh, she? Oh, yes. You know, she almost married my oldest brother, John. John? Yes. You remember John? No. He, he, uh, he used to take saxophone lessons by mail. John, a lot of people take saxophone lessons by mail. Yeah, but he didn't have a saxophone. Oh, he did it without a saxophone. <laughs> so he'd blow the lesson in an envelope and then mail it to a friend who oh, had, had a one. saxophone? Yes. <laughs> I'm surprised that uh, Millie gave him the air. He sounds real nuts. Uh, say, who is this fellow with his arm around you? Oh, that? <laughs> That's Mickey Rockford. Mickey <laughs> Rockford? Yes, he used to come to my house and we'd sit in the divan. Oh? Mm -hmm. But my little niece, Jean, used to hang around and watch. So uh, Mickey would pull a quarter out of his pocket and say, Three's a crowd and there's a good movie at the Bijou tonight. Mickey was pretty smart. Yeah. What happened? Oh, I know. When I got home from the Bijou, he was always gone. <laughs> In 1950, patriotism was in the air, and no sacrifice was too small for your country. San Francisco youngsters go to school for a new purpose. They are here to take part in the national distribution of identification tags. The tags, the first of which was issued to President Truman, carry the name and address of the recipient and space for the listing of his blood type. In case of war or other major disasters, the tags will be an immediate protection to the wearer and will help first aid crews to supply prompt relief. Everyone in the nation will receive a tag. Wear yours for your own safety. Secretary of Defense Marshall pays tribute to a man who paid with his life for his exertions on the Korean front. Al Jolson's son receives the Medal of Merit on behalf of his late father. After a strenuous entertainment tour over the battlefront and Japan, the famous Mammy Singer succumbed with an exhausted heart. Little Asa Albert and his mother have been left a priceless heritage. You know, there are plenty of good investments in this country, but I have one permanent share that no money can buy. My share in the United States of America. We are all shareholders getting priceless dividends every day just from being American. In this bountiful land, land of freedom, free press, free speech, freedom to gripe about what we don't like, freedom to change it, freedom to worship God, not the head man whose picture's on every wall, America, land of opportunity with a great future. For the future belongs to the free man, not the slave. You know, when I think of these things, and the hundreds of millions of people around the world who live in want and fear, I say to myself, brother, how lucky you are. This is your country. Defend it. It's your freedom. Protect it. 
It's your future. Build for it. Save for it. Buy shares in it. Sign up for the payroll savings where you work. Buy United States defense bonds regularly and hold on to them. And to end on a spiritual note. To a picturesque church in the Austrian Alps at Obendorf near Salzburg, villagers come to lift their hearts in song. To them, this famous Christmas carol has special meaning. It was composed here in Obendorf in 1818 by Father Franz Gruber, school teacher and parish priest. on the Korean front sound the keynote and echo the stalemate around the world in 1951. More than a million red casualties and 100,000 allied marked the second year of conflict which saw General MacArthur relieved of his post as commander-in-chief of the Far East. He served the nation and the United Nations with unfailing vigor. His record in previous campaigns brought him an enviable reputation as a fearless warrior. His many visits to the Korean front lines kept him constantly informed of the situation and the movements of the communist armies arrayed against his command. President Truman flew to meet with MacArthur last year, and on that occasion they discussed overall policy and apparently agreed on future conduct of the fight against red aggression. But in the final analysis, the disagreements between immediate strategy and international diplomacy resulted in General MacArthur's dismissal. At the White House, the administration, represented by the president, is seriously concerned. Mr. Truman speaks to the nation, outlining the reasons for his action regarding world policy. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea. A number of events have made it evident that General MacArthur did not agree with that policy. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. It is with the deepest personal regret that I found myself compelled to take this action. General MacArthur is one of our greatest military commanders. But the cause of world peace is much more important than any individual. America was stunned by reports of the mass murders of 5,500 of their own war prisoners slaughtered in cold blood behind communist lines. Stalemate was again the word for truce negotiations after more than 150 sessions between United Nations top-level officers and their red opposite numbers. The only conclusion reached definitely in the tent at Panmunjom with the communist representatives was the establishment of a buffer zone two and one half miles wide extending along the present battle zone above the 38th parallel. Despite resumed peace talks, war remains grim in Korea. The South Korean 5th Division launches an all-out assault in the Iron Triangle against a heavily entrenched enemy on the heights.
Dug in on the hillsides, the Reds are again hit with small arms fire by the 7th Division, now seasoned troops after 16 months of combat service. They flush out numerous prisoners as they turn on the heat. It is an action which has cost the Communist forces an estimated 25,000 in killed, wounded, and prisoners. This is the grueling battle of Bloody Ridge, where every foot of ground is bought at almost point-blank range. are driven out into the open and their positions become the target for a barrage that blasts every foot of their hillside. Tracers mark the spot. The war in Korea continues bitter and unrelenting, but the United Nations grind steadily forward toward victory. Mustangs on the prowl in Korea, dripping films of Air Force F-51 fighters diving down to strafe the Reds and Reds on ridgetops along the eastern front. Close support air warfare pays off. City's teeming millions, prime target for an atomic attack, go about their normal affairs. Suddenly, their daily routine is rudely shattered by the screaming wail of air raid sirens, warning them of a possible enemy onslaught. This first demonstration of an all-out civil defense drill by America's number one metropolis is a model of preparedness and training. All traffic halts, and pedestrians immediately seek shelter, guided by a corps of well-trained wardens. Passengers join the throngs, making their orderly ways to safety. If a bomb strikes, officials will be able to map the radius of the destruction. With the technical data at their disposal, they will direct civilian defense workers to the aid of those in peril or those who might have already suffered the all-out effects of an all-out enemy attack. Hospitals will place their facilities at the disposal of the injured, and Geiger counter experts will test patients and areas for possible atomic contamination. organizations. War can be very difficult, but it can get even more complicated if you have to sort out nine sets of twins in the same army. These guys are not only in the same army, they're in the same anti-aircraft battery training at Fort Lewis, Washington. Eight pairs of these brothers are so identical that when you look them over, your tactics are overwhelmed by your strategy. This top kick, for instance, is slightly bewildered as he checks off the detail in duplicate with copies all up the line. Doing a double take, he sounds off as approved by Army regulations for sergeants. KP and guard duty team up to further baffle the lower echelons. After a fast switcheroo by this pair of twins, the spuds are all eyes. The cookie gets a load of this combination and finds himself in a stew. Anyway, he seems to have a beef. 
Ordnance conducts a test of a new amphibious truck at Rainbow Springs, Florida. Fitted with a snorkel for air intake and a snorter for exhaust, the two and a half ton vehicle submerges. This is part of an underwater service cruise which keeps the truck under operation for periods ranging up to four hours. The driver, equipped with a portable lung breather, goes right down to Davy Jones's locker along with his craft, which is known in the trade as the Eager Beaver. thumb a ride for a submersible hitchhike. Seriously, though, this amphibious marvel can travel on land as efficiently as it can underwater. Up she rises. And as she rises, she blows her tubes just like a submarine. One of the Army's latest weapons for defense. Gangway, gun factory Gertie is back. Remember Gertie? She's Rosie the Riveter's cousin. And she's back on the job at the Naval Gun Factory in Washington, where she did such good work in World War II. The Navy issued a call for 500 a short time ago. The response has been terrific. As one man put it, they signed up so fast we had a duck. Mrs. Lavesta Weston is 61, oldest of the new group, whose presence here relieves me for military service. Gertie's back and doing the job. It's Derby Day in San Francisco, a diaper derby for daddies. Red Cross headquarters is the Churchill Downs for the race to see which father can do the fastest pinup. Sailor Gene Moser and offspring are among the hundreds of entries. And there's trouble in the starting gate for Jerry Herman. Can't seem to pin baby up or down. Maybe a chair from the mothers will help. It'll take more than cheers from mother. It'll take mother herself. The champ of the quick change artists is Bob Greenberg, and he receives the crown of his royalty. He's the king. Mother says he can do all the changes now, and just look at his handiwork. Long live the king. also takes its place as the year of the great investigations, during which the links between the underworld and politics are given a thorough airing. Chief among the committees was the Senate group, headed by Senator Estes Kefauver, which brought its proceedings vividly to the American public, with ex-Mayor O'Dwyer of New York testifying before newsreel cameras. A reluctant witness was gambler Frank Costello, reputed kingpin in gambling circles. Here is one specific question put to him concerning the assets he kept in cash in his strong box in his home. Do you have $100,000 in cash in that strong box? I said I would not know. Even a note of glamour is injected into the thrill-packed proceedings by the presence of Virginia Hill, in whose home the late Bugsy Siegel was killed. She denies any Costello connection. Did you ever get any money from uh, Costello? No. And uh, did you ever uh, get any money from Maya Lansky? I never got money from any of those fellas. None of those None fellas. None of those fellas. No. The climax comes when Costello refuses to answer further questions. Mr. Halley, all due respect for the sons, which I have an awful lot of respect for, I'm not going to answer another question. You just says I'm not under arrest and I'm going to walk out. Now, I, sh I should explain to you exactly what the legal situation is. You are under subpoena, and if, as I assume the chairman instructs you to remain and answer questions, you will thereby become guilty of contempt of this Senate committee. Repercussions from the New York hearings have been nationwide, with contempt and perjury citations indicated by the committee. And with this summation of public sentiment by former Ambassador Spruill Braden, now heading the Anti-Crime Committee in New York, who says... Of one thing we can be sure, the Costellos, Adonises, and the rest of this scum, and still more, the miserably corrupted law enforcement officers are among the Kremlin's best friends. Ever was the nation made more probe conscious.
spice with all the ingredients needed for a well-rounded diet of speed and thrills and spine-tingling excitement, 1951 was a big year in sports. Season in and season out, the kings and queens of sports' dramatic domain cooked up new recipes and set out to prove that records are made only to be broken, that perfection is never a static quality. And what a year it was for baseball and the New York Giants. Leo DeRocha's miracle team spotted the Dodgers a 13-game lead in mid-August, then overtook them, forcing a three-game playoff. Remember Branca's fatal pitch and Bobby Thompson's storybook home run in the ninth inning of the third game that gave the Giants the pennant? The polo grounds burst its seams that afternoon when Thompson's blast exploded the Dodgers into oblivion and gave the Giants their first pennant in many a long year. With all due respect to the Yankees, the World Series was an anticlimax after this dramatic wind-up of the National League race. America loves baseball and it loves miracles. It got both in 1951. Biggest number on the grid scene was 42. Princeton's dashing Dick Kazmaier, the triple threat tailback from Maumee, Ohio. Top man in almost every football poll in the country, Kaz ran and passed and booted his way into football's Hall of Fame. Tennessee was rated the top team of the land, but Kazmaier ran away with the individual honors. The daring do of touchdown Dick in 51 will long be remembered by football fans. Churchill Downs and the Kentucky Derby, richest in history, and a slow-motion record of a stunning upset by a hitherto unknown 15-to-1 shot. Count Turf, son and grandson of Derby winners, hitting the biggest jackpot in the history of America's great turf classic. His owner once sold peanuts at the ballpark, but he rode the gravy train at Churchill Downs. Count Turf, making Derby Day 1951 unforgettable. The big story in golf was the little man who came back. Texas Ben Hogan, once so badly injured in an auto accident, nobody thought he'd ever play again. But he did, and at Birmingham, he holed out with a three under par to win the Open, his third U.S. Open title. The biggest little guy in golf. Boxing had its two-fisted impact on the sporting scene. And out of the slam bang came the defeat of Ezard Charles at Pittsburgh by the veteran Jersey Joe Walcott. Prayer and stubborn determination brought a new world's heavyweight champ. Yankee Stadium won't be the same picture without that glove and the man behind the glove. Joe DiMaggio announces his retirement after 13 seasons with the Yanks. His bosses, Topping and Webb, and his manager, Casey Stengel, will miss the great center fielder, who said recurring injuries made him decide to quit at 37. National League President Ford Frick looks on as Mayor Impelitari unveils a plaque commemorating the 75th anniversary of baseball senior circuit. The unveiling takes place at the site where Major League Ball was founded, Broadway at 3rd Street in New York. In the Broadway Central Hotel, old-timers like Arlie Latham of the Reds talk over old times. Arlie is 91, but he's still full of pep. Celebrating with him are members of Baseball's Hall of Fame. Ty Cobb. George Sisler. Roger Hornsby. Chris Speaker. Carl Hubble and other immortals of the great American game pose for their pictures on a sparkling birthday, a diamond jubilee of the diamond. Lady Wrestling at Turner's Arena in Washington, D.C., but not ladylike wrestling. Gloria Baratina gets tossed by Nell Stewart, and the goodly throng of fight fans hoot and holler for fireworks a la weaker sex. Blonde Nell Stewart, the tornado from Texas, who's fought 1,200 bouts and rakes in about 20 grand a year playing rough, tries her famous knee lift on glamorous Gloria, the last from Maryland who forsook a career in opera for a more profitable area in the arena. Texas Nell sings a different tune when her operatic opponent gets in the pile driver's seat and starts riding herd on Nell. This is where Miss Stewart begins to fall behind. The even tenor of Nell's winning ways is rudely shattered when her soprano foe plays a bass trick on her. It's the beginning of the end for the veteran of many bouts and a temporary death knell for Nell. Her lone star is eclipsed by the newcomer from operatic ranks, Gloria Baratina.
muscle men mingle in Los Angeles. And setting a new world's record in the national weightlifting contest is John Davis of Brooklyn. 340 pounds, and Davis shakes his head. And don't ask me why. Doug Hepburn tries the same weight. Lightweight Joe DiPietro of Patterson, New Jersey, lifts 230 pounds to take first in his class. the bicep boys make with the muscles seeking this year's Mr. America title. Now please girls, no whistling. Roy Elegant of Oakland, California seems to be head and shoulders above the crowd. Yep, Roy Elegant gets the nod, the title and the trophy. Mr. America of 1951. Looking into our crystal ball, we come up with swimsuit fashions for 1952. These are called heavenly bodies because they are out of this world and are being shown by Cole at Hollywood. Gold lastex, sparkling with plenty of stardust and plenty of imagination. This is called the wing ding. Wear it up or down for obvious reasons. And here is the triple threat in terry cloth. Wear this as a draped skirt, a hooded cape, or as a bare shoulder pool dress. Next in the solar system of swim styles is a skirted petal suit. Pack your trunks and head for the beach. Here's an invitation that gets an immediate response. It's got Dunk Me written all over it, and a mighty cute line it is, too. Mother and Tots are going to be well suited in their fashion. The word from Toronto, where leading hairstylists from all over congregated this week, is shorter hair for you gals. And here are some of the coiffures cooked up by the experts who say so. This one's called Fantasy, by way of Paris. Also Parisian is this arrangement, especially created for cocktail parties, old-fashioned at that. The Greek-Roman influence is apparent in this design, while a spray of spring flowers is a crowning touch for this hairdo. This coiffure won first prize for its designer. Other awards were based on originality alone. For instance... We don't know what the Toronto subway has to do with shorter hair. Oh, it's over any man's head. Here's a gent who thinks that most of his hair is too close to his scalp. So he comes to a clip joint to get a once-over lightly. It seems that the Mohican hairdo is all the rage in Paris. The barber doesn't speak the redskin dialect, but like all barbers, he can cut your hair in seven different languages. Big haircut. And now that the tomahawk routine is over, here's the warlock. The first of the last of the Mohicans. Cute, no? No. Well, let's not split hairs. It's Oscar night in Hollywood, glamour capital of the world. On hand for this year's ceremonies are Frank Sinatra and his lovely wife, Ava Gardner. Milton Berle sneaks in a quick peck while Frank's not looking. Robert Preston looks to be in fine fettle, as does popular Jimmy Stewart. And the fans are as eager as ever to find out who will come out on top.
Francis the Mule receives an honorary degree from Goodwill Industries in Los Angeles in recognition, quote, of his achievements, including his reputed ability to talk, unquote. Yep, that's what she says. Complete with cap and gown, the four-footed movie star gets the hood, making him doctor of mulosophy. Just call me Doc. Inside the diploma, they're stashed a carrot, and with that, Francis goes to the races. Grand Central Station crowds welcome another Hollywood star to the East Coast. That scintillating five-year-old of screen fame, Bonzo, is greeted by curvaceous Gene Williams, president of the Bonzo Fan Club. The new film celebrity will spend a week in New York being wined and dined as befits his popularity before starting on a nationwide tour to make personal appearances on behalf of his universal international film feature, Bedtime for Bonzo. He registers his simian signature and demands a twin bedroom at four coconuts per day. He'll probably wind up with a couple of trees and connecting grapevine. Before hitting the sack, he has to call his Hollywood agent, arrange his itinerary, send flowers to his girlfriend, and leave a call for 7.30 jungle time. After all, there's no business like monkey business. On the international scene, two couples made headlines in 1951. In Buenos Aires, hundreds of thousands converge on Argentina's Independence Day Square to petition Juan Perón and his wife, Evita, to run for the presidency and vice presidency of Argentina. It's the biggest political rally in Latin American history. Two million persons jam the Broad Avenue 9th of July to make Juan Perón change his mind about running for re-election and his dynamic wife to consent to run on the same ticket. After an interval in which the crowds roared Peronista slogans, President Perón accepted, telling his backers, we subject ourselves to the decision of the people. Then Evita tosses her hat in the ring. History's first Mr. and Mrs. Presidential Team. One of the greatest peacetime spy dramas in the nation's history reaches its climax as Julius Rosenberg and Morton Sobel, convicted of revealing atomic secrets to the Russians, enter the federal building in New York to hear their doom. Another of the spy ring, Mrs. Ethel Rosenberg, who with her husband was convicted of actually transmitting the secrets to Russia through Soviet diplomatic channels. The ring was first uncovered following the arrest of Klaus Fuchs in England. David Greenglass, Mrs. Rosenberg's brother, confessed theft of the secrets while stationed at the Los Alamos Atomic Project. He later became the government's chief witness in the prosecution of Sobel and the Rosenbergs. It is a stern jurist they face in Judge Irving Kaufman. After administering a tongue lashing in which he charged them with the indirect death of thousands of men in Korea, he sentenced both Rosenbergs to death in the electric chair and Sobel to 30 years in prison. At the time these pictures were made, Greenglass still had to hear his fate. It is the first time in peacetime that such a death penalty has been handed down. And while appeals to the highest courts are planned, it certainly appears that the spies are headed along a one-way street. To close out the year, let's look at a couple of people who are just a bit different. This housewife, Mrs. Jerry Coburn, having read of Lady Godiva's famous ride, got inspired. And off she went to protest an increase in local taxes. The whole town cooperated with this stunt, uh, with one minor exception. Guess we'll have to file this story under B for brrr, but this next one definitely goes under O for ouch. <laughs> This human pincushion, Scarab Bay, says, hit me. He's out to beat the world's record for immunity to pain. Ouch! Well, that's what you would say, but Scarab Bay is a complete stoic to such pinpricks. This modern faker claims he was inspired by St. Sebastian, and also claims that planks full of nails are mere playthings, not worth his consideration. Scarra thinks he could fight it out with a sewing machine, but figures the only thing that could beat him would be a wound to his pride. That would really get under his skin.